The Quarterly, Job and Proverbs. Lesson 4, Job 32 to 33, Elihu. Before Job receives his climactic encounter with God, there is a contribution of Elihu to consider. It's not really a dialogue between Elihu and Job, because Job doesn't have anything to say in reply, at least not anything that's recorded in the book. That leads to a wide variety of evaluations amongst commentators, both historic and more recent, of the value of Elihu's speeches. Some scholars believe that Elihu's words are simply the arguments of Job's three friends warmed over, with nothing new added, which is why Job says nothing in return. But if Elias whose speeches are entirely redundant, it's hard to explain why the writer takes up so much of the book with these useless words. Elihu is assigned four speeches, one more than Eliphaz and Bildad, and two more than Zophar. In fact, if Elihu is simply rehearsing the same point of view as the three friends, then it's also not clear why Elihu is not ultimately rebuked by God, in the way that the three friends are, for not speaking what is true about God. See Job 42, 7. Certainly, Elihu himself believes that his contributions are something new. 32, verses 11 and 12. He feels compelled to speak because the three older friends have not successfully countered Job's arguments, which he intends to do. On the other hand, however, it's not clear that Elihu speaks simply for God either, as many older commentators argued. He comes across as brash and self-confident for all his protestations of humility. At times, he seems to echo parts of what Job's friends have said charging Job with a self-righteousness that he never claimed. If we compare Job 33.9 with 11.4, the only two places in the book to use the Hebrew word zach, which means pure. The best evaluation of Elihu, I think, is somewhere in the middle. He does reaffirm parts of what Job's friends have said, perhaps, but he frames the arguments differently. Instead of insisting that Job's suffering is necessarily the result of his sin, Elihu is concerned to confront Job's sin that has resulted from his suffering. At the same time, Elihu affirms the positive value that suffering has in the life of the believer, something that Job's friends never do. As the hymn to wisdom made clear, not every human question can be answered. Yet wisdom may always be found in submitting ourselves into the hand of our Creator with reverent fear. A major break in the flow of the book is marked by the opening of this chapter. So these three men ceased to answer Job, Job 32.1. The reason given is that he was righteous, or we might say right, in his own eyes. Now normally in the Bible this is a bad thing. See Proverbs 12.15 or Judges 17.6 since it typically contrasts with doing what the Lord has commanded. In Job's case, however, his uprightness will ultimately be vindicated by the Lord. So it's no fault that he refused to accept his friend's rigid assertion that all of Job's suffering was due to some unspecified and unrepented sin. Yet in trying to defend himself against their charges, Job's answers to the three friends have focused more on himself and his own righteousness than in defending the Lord's uprightness. And it's this that triggers Elihu's response. Elihu is not merely intellectually dissatisfied with the outcome, or we might say non-outcome, of this theological debate. He burned with anger, a point repeated three times, Job 32, 2, 3, and 5. Anger both at Job and at the three friends. His anger with Job lay in the fact that Job had sought to justify himself rather than the Lord, while his anger with the friends is due to the fact that they had failed to answer Job adequately. It's twice repeated that they had no answer for Job, verses 3 and 5. They accused Job repeatedly of sin, 
but had entirely failed to make their charges stick. Now, it's worth noting that these comments come to us from the narrator of the book, not merely from Elihu himself, which makes them more likely to be trustworthy evaluations. Yet it's also striking that in the epilogue of the book, when the Lord is said likewise to burn with anger, his anger is only directed against the three friends, not Job. Chapter 42, verse 7. That suggests that Elihu might not be entirely in the right in his anger with Job. Perhaps compassion would have provided a better platform from which to speak to one who was suffering so greatly, especially in view of his own youth and lack of life experience of comparable trials. Elihu begins by outlining the reasons why he had not spoken hitherto. Job 32.6 he was young and inexperienced. While deference to age and maturity was a key value in that culture and in the Bible more generally. Wisdom generally takes time to acquire, verse 7, while fools are always eager to step forward and share their opinions widely, Proverbs 29 20. So he gave Job's older friends the floor first. But then he was severely disappointed in their words which demonstrated that age does not necessarily confer wisdom. Verse 9. Rather, true insight comes from God alone. Verse 8. Elihu was particularly frustrated by the present silence of Job's three friends. Having heard Job's responses, they had nothing left to say to confront him. Verse 15. It seems that they were waiting for God to finish his work and put Job to death, vanquish him, verse 13, while they sit on the sidelines and watch complacently. For all Elihu's proclamation of his youth, he feels compelled to speak. He's like a wineskin containing new wine, whose gases must be vented, lest the wineskin burst, verse 19. For someone who claims to have such pure motivations, I don't know how to flatter, verse 22, and who claims indirectly to have received insight by God's inspiration, verse 8, Elihu's speech spends a lot of time talking about himself. Note the frequent use of I, me, and my. Elihu seems to have a high view of his own opinion, which brings us to reconsider verse 16. God may vanquish him, not a man. In Elihu's speech, this is what Job's friends are saying wrongly absolving themselves of the responsibility to continue to argue with Job. Yet, of course, in the grand scheme of the book, this statement is entirely true. Even Elihu, for all of his new and better insights, will not be the one who changes Job's mind. That will only come when God himself comes face to face and vanquishes him in his glory, without killing him. Elihu now turns to Job and confronts him directly in chapter 33. He continues to talk about talking, more than he does about actually addressing Job's situation. He's giving Job reasons to listen to him, reasons that focus largely on Elihu's uprightness and divinely inspired insight. Elihu apparently will speak the truth from God himself, given to him by the Spirit, and yet he comes in a form that will not terrify Job in a way that an unmediated theophany would, and indeed will, as we'll see in chapters 38 to 41. Elihu is mere human, like Job. In a vivid image, he is similarly pinched off from a piece of clay. Verse 6. In some respects, therefore, Elihu is an answer to Job's request for a human mediator to stand between him and God. See Job 9, 32 to 33. But Elihu is not yet the perfect mediator between God and man. He misrepresents Job's claims, just as Zophar did, suggesting that Job presented himself as pure. Job 33, 9, compare 11, 4. Completely without transgression, and yet nonetheless being treated by God as his enemy. 
there's actually a play on words here. Since Job's name, Yov, is like the Hebrew word for enemy, Oyev. Thus far, Elihu's speech is not very different from that of Job's three friends, suggesting the intimate connection between Job's sin and his suffering. But in verses 12 to 22, Elihu introduces a new idea, not mentioned hitherto, which is that God sometimes has gracious reasons for introducing suffering into the lives of human beings. Those who suffer are not always God's enemies. On the contrary, God may use suffering to warn someone and turn them back from their sin, subduing their pride so as to preserve them from perishing in the pit. Sometimes, Elihu says, God uses dreams to accomplish this goal, verses 15 and 16. At other times, he uses sufferings to turn people to himself, verses 19 to 22. Now, often people misunderstand these messages. Like dreams, sufferings really need an angelic mediator to interpret them, so they may bring us to true repentance and restoration, verses 23 to 27. This is true. It is at least moving towards a solution to Job's questions. Yet it still seems to place too much of the fault on Job. Job, if only you would listen better to the Lord's leading, then you would repent and be restored. See verses 27 to 28. In reality, as we know from the frame, Job is not at fault in his suffering. He's simply frustrated at God's apparent silence towards him in the midst of that suffering. Application questions. One, what positive fruit has suffering brought in your life? Two, does suffering always bring good fruit? Three, why does anger make it hard for us to help other people? How can we confront our own anger so we can love other people better? Four, how is Jesus a better friend to Job than Elihu was? Thank you.